Hey everyone, welcome to Build 2021. My name is Jeffrey Mew and I'm Program Manager here at Microsoft on the Python Data Science and AI team in Visual Studio Code. Hey everyone, my name is Sana and I'm also a Program Manager on the VS Code team and excited to show you what's latest and greatest in VS Code. Firstly, uh, I'll be going over all the Jupyter Notebook and PyTorch features that are new to VS Code. Then Sana will show you how you can use notebooks for other things that you might not have expected in VS Code. And finally, we'll wrap up with showcasing the new Node.js debugging and testing features as well. Throughout this talk, we'll have experts in the chat ready to answer your questions. So feel free to ask any of them throughout this presentation. So let's get started. First of all, what are Jupyter Notebooks? Jupyter Notebooks are an interactive development tool that mixes code, visualizations, equations, and narrative text. So in the context of Python, you can imagine like a Python file, except there are sections, which we call cells here, in the file. And you can run any cell in any order and any number of times, which invites experimentation and iteration. This document you're seeing right now is actually a Jupyter Notebook. Secondly, if you're not familiar with PyTorch, it's one of the fastest growing and most popular Python machine learning frameworks um, out there that make it easier for data scientists and developers alike to build and train models. Because of these tools becoming so popular within the Python community, we've been working on making Jupyter Notebooks and PyTorch development in VS Code a first class experience. So today I'll be going through a typical PyTorch machine learning project in VS Code. I'll be walking you step by step through the project from the data exploration to training to finally deployment. And alongside, I'll be showcasing all the PyTorch and data science features that VS Code has to offer. Great, so uh, I already have VS Code opened up as you can already see. And once you actually have VS Code installed, you'll just need to go into the extensions tab to download the Python extension because that is where all of the Jupyter Notebook and PyTorch related and data science features I'm showcasing today are gonna reside as well. Once you have the Python extension and VS Code installed, uh, now we can get started. So everyone's talking about stocks nowadays. You've probably heard of some colleagues or friends talk about GameStop and Tesla stocks. I decided to get in the fun of it by building a simple PyTorch project to try and predict and model the Microsoft stock price. So you can see here, um, I have this demo where uh, I trained this model. I put it to an endpoint in Azure, and then um, I can just call that endpoint from anywhere, so within my Jupyter Notebook, and it gives me a prediction of the stock price and a fun little picture according. So for this project, uh, we'll be using uh, PyTorch inside Jupyter Notebooks, the build and train model. And a quick disclaimer, I'm not a financial expert here. This project's just for fun. <laughs> if the project worked 100% of the time, I'd probably be rich right now. So to get started, um, I have my PyTorch project opened up in VS Code already, as you can see. And I actually have my Jupyter Notebook, which I had the slides earlier, uh, which has all my PyTorch code for the stock price model. And when you actually open up a notebook in VS Code, this is what we call our Jupyter Notebook editor. Um, from within this notebook, you can they do a lot of common notebook actions, such as add cells, um, here, you can run write code, run cells, move cells, et cetera. Also, I might be stepping through the code a little bit quickly since the focus here is mostly around tooling. So feel free to pause the video anytime to look at the code in more detail. So going back to the MLflow diagram, one of the first things we'll need to do with any data science project will be to import the data set. So in my first cell in my code, I'm actually going to be importing my data set from the Yavin Finance API. And I can quickly just click this run icon, or I can hit shift enter to run the cell. If I want to look at my data more carefully, um, I can actually open up the, data, uh, the variable explorer here. And the variable explorer is really powerful because it keeps track of all your active variables as well as their most up-to-date value. And from the variable explorer, I can find my variable I just created. So you can see DF right here and click this icon and it'll open up our data viewer. So the data viewer is really powerful because um, it's, a, makes, it's essentially a human readable, makes it your data frame much more human readable format and Excel-like interface. So in the data viewer, I can do things such as filter and sort the columns of data. So by just clicking this, um, I can also quickly look at column names to figure out the game plan of what I actually need to do with my data. So in this scenario, I can see that I'll need the date column and the close column, because the close is the closing price of the day, so this is what we want to predict upon. So knowing this, I can go back to my code, only select those two columns, um, quickly run it again with the uh, Jupyter Hotkey Shift Enter, and then if I want to view the up-to-date value, I can just click this refresh icon, and now I can see the most up-to-date value, and I can, this is a great sanity check to see that what I'm doing is correct. Um, I can also look at the plot uh, view of that data if I want to look at it in much more uh, visual format to see the trends as well, if you prefer that. But now that I have a pretty good understanding of my data set, it's time to actually pre-process the data. So I have some basic transformations here that I'm applying to my data. So I'm doing things such as removing the missing data and normalizing the values between uh, one and negative one as well. Um, the last step, uh, so I can quickly run that again by just saying shift enter. And then the last step after I pre-process the data will be to convert the data to tensors. And tensors are just a variable type that PyTorch understands and works with. You can just think of it like a matrix data type. But again, I've written a basic function to do this. So you can see here. And this function, uh, again, I can run it by hitting Shift Enter. And it will actually uh, not only convert to tensors, but also spl uh, split the data set between my training and testing sets as well. So um, if I want to look at these newly created variables, I can actually just go back to my uh, variable explorer here 
find these new variables. You can see x train, x test. And what's great is I can actually see that A, they were converted to tensors, so you can see the tensor types now. And B, I can actually see the training and testing split distribution. And again, if I want to you do that sanity check to look at my data um, to make sure that everything looks right, I can actually open it up in the data viewer. And what's great is uh, we actually recently added not only this, the ability to um, view tensors, so both PyTorch and TensorFlow tensors within the data viewer, but as well, you can see that this is a three-dimensional tensor. And you might be wondering, how, how can we actually look at three-dimensional data within this two-dimensional grid? But, but we actually recently added this feature called slicing. And this will show up when you have any multi-dimensional uh, data open up in the data viewer. But here, um, you can actually slice any two dimensions of your multi-dimensional data to get a 2D slice of the data that you want to see. Um, and again, you can use the axis dropdowns here, uh, or you can just use the text box, whichever one you prefer. And again, I can make use of all the previous data viewer features, so like filtering sorting, just to make sure that you can see here, all my data is between the values of negative one and one. So again, it's just another really great sanity check. So going back to the machine learning workflow, now that I've actually pre-processed my data and got ready for the PyTorch model, um, the next step is to actually well, build the model itself. So for this project, we're going to be using something called the GRU model. And as you can see, um, here's my code that I defined the GRU model. And um, you can also see that the PyTorch APIs can kind of be a little bit complicated since PyTorch has many functions in each with their own parameters, and it's kind of hard to keep track of them all. So VS Code helps with this by using PyLance to give auto-completions and doc strings as well. So for example, if I jump to my model code here, and if I want to add another fully connected layer, I can type self.fc, and I can use nn dot. And as you can see, as I type dot, uh, PyLance is giving me um, suggestions on the top uh, top APIs used by the uh, neural net library, as well as if I want to use linear, which I'm going to be using, it gives me a doc string. So it's really great. It tells me what the arguments are, what the parameters are, how to use them, and what the best part is, um, is examples of how to use it. So I don't actually have to go back and forth between Google and Stack Overflow to look up and search documentation. The other thing is, the, as you can see, the model, uh, the code explaining the model is kind of hard to visualize in terms of what the model actually looks like in layers of the architecture. So we're actually be using a tool called TensorBoard to help us. And TensorBoard is a free and open source dashboard companion made by Google to help PyTorch and TensorFlow developers uh, visualize different attributes and aspects of their ML models and training. So PyTorch training is like driving a car. You can think of TensorBoard as like the dashboard in front of you feeding the information. And what's great is one of the newest PyTorch features in VS Code is built-in TensorBoard integration. So you can launch at any time by um, opening up the command palette with Control Shift P or Command Shift P if you're on a Mac and searching for the keyword launch TensorBoard. And when you click on this, um, VS Code is smart enough where we'll use your current working directory by default, but you can also select another folder as well. Um, I've already opened this just for the sake of this um, demo, but um, getting back to the problem of looking at the model architecture, we can actually now navigate to the graphs tab and we can actually view and interact with our PyTorch model. So you can see here, um, I have one model opened up, so I created LSTM GRU models. Um, but here I can see the model architecture and what's, this is especially useful when you're looking at someone else's PyTorch code, maybe on GitHub or something for the first time and you want to get a better understanding of how they built their model and what their model does. Cool, so now that we've actually developed our models and we have a better understanding of our architecture, we can now start running our training set against the model. Again, uh, I've previously ran the training, so not everyone here has to watch my code run for hours on my laptop. But if you want to actually leverage faster compute, you can use the remote SSH extension for VS Code to connect your backend of VS Code to remote compute, such as like a GPU on Azure to speed up your um, compute time. And once it's connected, it'll just be the exact same VS Code experience as you just saw, but you'll actually be leveraging the remote compute of that machine in the backend. Again, once our model is trained, um, we can now use our test set that we saved because we did that train test split to see how much or see how well our model prefer, performs in the real world examples. So again, I've run this against the testing set here. You can see this is the uh, the blue line is the predicted Microsoft stock price based on the model, and the red one is the real Microsoft stock price. And you can see the model actually gets a pretty decent approximation of the stock price just um, over the last uh, just using the last five years of data. And again, this model is just a super simple two layer model, so with a more complex model, the results could probably be better. Well, cool. so finally, now that we know how our model code works and we've successfully been able to train our model, we can try to optimize our training with the newly released PyTorch Profiler, which is a joint uh, project between Microsoft and Facebook. So to access the PyTorch Profiler, you'll just need to have the latest version of PyTorch installed. And once you have it installed, you'll just need to import torch.profiler into your code to use the APIs to start profiling. And if you want to view the results of the profiling, um, all you need to do is just to go back to your TensorFlow tab. And you can see there's this new tab here called PyTorch Profiler, which is for um, the profiler. And uh, there's a lot of things 
a lot of powerful tools in here, but too many to cover this time. But I just wanted to highlight this overview screen, which tells you a breakdown of where time is spent during your PyTorch training, as well um, if you have like uh, any performance recommendations, it'll also tell you what to do as well. Um, going Jumping back to this, what's even better is um, the other great benefit of having both TensorBoard and PyTorch Profiler directly integrated into VS Code is that we've added the exclusive ability to jump to source code from Profiler stack traces. So for example, if I go to this operator view, I want to see um, what functions in my code I actually call this like add function, um, how many times I can just jump to view my call frames, and I can just click uh, on my user code here, and you'll see VS Code automatically opens up my code side by side, and I can jump to it and make the optimizations and edits that I need. So now that I've actually finished training our model, optimized our code based on the performance of the profile's recommendations, I'm ready to share my code with Sana on Git. So um, to do so, I can just quickly go to the source control tab and click on the notebook that I want to diff so you can see stocks.ipymb. And you can actually see there's a, it gives you a really nice UI. So rather than having to view JSON diffs, you can just actually see a human readable format of what's different in your notebook. And finally, once I'm happy with the model, the last step is just to save the model as a pickled serializable file here. Um, so I'm saving as checkpoint.pth, as you can also see in my folder here. Um, and then from here, I can just use Azure to deploy to the cloud. And what's great is uh, within VS Code, Azure has built-in direct integrations to Azure services. So things like Azure Machine Learning if you want to run experiments, Azure Functions if you want to host endpoint, and Azure Storage if you want to store your model to the cloud. So from here, I can just download the extensions that I need and directly deploy within VS Code. Cool, so just to quickly summarize, like we went through the typical machine learning workflow of data, from data exploration to model training to deployment to create a model to predict the Microsoft stock prices. And the best part of it was that everything I did today was within VS Code. Um, it's your all-in-one Python tool. So just, if you want to learn more, just check out aka.ms slash notebooks. So I'll pass it over to Sana now, who will talk about some of the other cool things you can do with VS Code notebooks. All right, thanks, Jeffrey. I thought the variable explorer and the data viewer was really, really useful, and I could definitely see how it's useful for any kind of data analysis that you might do. I want to take the notebook that you were using, though, and maybe just ask a more general question. How are notebooks useful for developers, um, and what can they bring to developers? Right? Notebooks were initially designed uh, for literary programming to make code more readable for humans. And so if we take a step back and look at what a notebook really is consisting of, it's markdown, code, and output. The markdown is just to explain what the code cells are doing. The code, like we saw in your notebook, was Python, but it can be any other language. And the output is any kind of rich output, like graphs, tables, or just system output. So we like really liked this notebook format um, of being able to take a program, break it up into individual chunks, and then run each chunk and get some kind of interactive output. So technically, you could open any kind of file as a notebook, and so that really got us thinking. The last couple of months, we've spent a lot of time working on new custom notebook support, and I'm really excited to share that with you today. The new custom notebooks API allows us to create custom native to VS Code notebooks for any kind of scenario, even beyond data science. Custom notebooks are different from Jupyter notebooks. Jupyter notebooks, like you just showed, live in the Jupyter ecosystem and can be run there or in VS Code. The Jupyter Notebooks extension does take advantage of the new notebook API, but custom VS Code notebooks contain code that is run by VS Code extensions and their output is rendered within the VS Code UI. So there's lots of advantages to using the custom notebooks. Uh, you can take advantage of the custom ecosystem of extensions in VS Code and also use it for any kind of domain beyond data science. So let me show you some of the new ways that our, the our team has rethought what notebooks could be used for. For instance, our team manages all of our work inside GitHub. All of our issues, all of our uh, backlog and planning is all on GitHub. So naturally, it made sense to create a GitHub issues notebook. So this extension is in the marketplace and can be found um, and downloaded today in VS Code Insiders. Once you have the extension, you can go over and create a new file called GitHub issues. And this allows us to query VS Code repo, or actually any repo for that matter, and easily see the results in the notebook interface. So I can create a code cell or markdown. You can see here that the code cell, the language mode of this code cell is type GitHub issues. So let's go ahead and just try writing a query. I'm gonna define a variable for the Microsoft VS Code repo, and I can start getting IntelliSense. All right, so the Notebooks API allows us to create a custom language 
in the cells and also create a custom execution engine for each cell. So now let's start querying against this variable that we just defined. So let's look at all the open issues that have been assigned to me. And again, I am using the same query language as I would on GitHub. All right, super neat. I get this really rich output um, that where I can see GitHub profile pictures, I can see the labels, I can see the issues. I can also interact with the code cell a little bit more. So for instance, clicking on this opens up the query on GitHub for me. So I, it opened this up for me on GitHub, which is really neat. And I can also change the way the output is being rendered. So the notebook is rendering the output in this GitHub issues format, but we can also make it markdown, obviously not as rich. So let's just go back to GitHub issues and let's keep querying. So another cool part about this extension is that I can actually query against multiple repos. So let me go ahead and paste this. And so now I wanna query against all the repos that my team owns and see all my open issues. So I can run this and actually drag and drop cells uh, in different orders. So let's drag this back up, change the variable over here to be repo, and now look at all of the issues I have open across all of my different repos. So it's cool that our team actually uses this in our development process today. I've copied over a few of the example notebooks, but if you go over to the GitHub repo for the VS Code team, you can actually see this as a part of our repo. Here's an example of an notebook that our team uses every day, uh, every week while we're in our development iteration. Um, every team member can go ahead and go through this and look at all their open issues across all of our repos. We've divided it up with the markdown into different sections by bugs, feature requests, et cetera. And you can also start harnessing the code editing features that VS Code provides. So for instance, in this cell, I could go in and show the different line numbers, make it more easier to read. I can go into another cell, maybe look at what this variable is defined as, so I can go peek the definition of it. So I'm getting that rich editing experience I'm used to in my editor, but I'm getting it now in these notebook cells. So that's just one example of a custom notebook that we've thought of. I wanna show one more. If you're a web developer, um, often you're spending a lot of time playing with web APIs um, or maybe creating and testing with simple requests. So now there's another cool extension that one of our teammates worked on called the REST book. And you can download that again from the marketplace today. And let me open up our express server. And I already have one created. So I've got our simple Node.js express app running. It's a very simple app with a couple of endpoints. So let's check it out. Let's run this cell. And immediately I get back another really rich output. Right. This output has my Express app running with lots of metadata. I can search through different parts of my metadata. I can also change the output of this. So it is of type REST book, but if we want, we can also change it to be HTML and really easily validate what my endpoint um, is giving me back. So let's keep going and make sure that our endpoint um, is correctly fetching data. So let's go ahead and run this and we can see there's different endpoints over here. What's cool is I can also start copying and pasting cells. So going over to the cell here, I can press C and I can press V and immediately copy the same cell. Let's change this to be one of the other endpoints. All right, so we can keep going in this like very iterative way to start testing our API. A really cool feature that I wanna show here is that uh, we can also, like we did earlier in the GitHub issues notebook, we can uh, define variables. In this case, we can use them as query parameters. So for instance, I could do this um, and have this equal the variable R. And now in the next cell, I can use that previous cell as a query parameter. So let's go ahead and maybe uh, add a new query parameter and reference it from the previous cell. All right, so now we see that again, it's passed between cells and that's a really cool way to use in this notebook. Um, one more thing that we can do in this notebook is not just do get requests, but also post requests. So I can go ahead and post a message and execute that. And I definitely get back my response. So this is a really neat way uh, for web developers to start using notebooks, right? We, we took two things that we're doing day to day, which is testing APIs and um, are managing our backlog. And now we can do both of those from VS Code within our inner development loop and use the concise and organized 
um, format of notebooks to, to take advantage of getting their rich output, right? Bringing notebooks directly into the core of VS Code, we're able to combine with the other engineering advantages that being in VS Code gives us, such as security, performance, and accessibility, as well as the entirety of the ecosystem, such as key bindings, themes, and other editor extensions. So a lot of you, um, you know, might be thinking, how can I use custom notebooks on my team? Um, get your notebooks out, get your thinking caps on, and think about how this might apply to your team or what are processes within your team that might be useful to do uh, within a notebook. Things we've heard are like onboarding new teammates. For instance, you could have a self-documented toolkit or scripts in your code base so when someone new joins, they can easily go through it within a notebook. It's also really useful for education scenarios and teaching someone to code um, within a classroom. So we've talked a lot about notebooks. I want to leave you with a couple of ways to try it out yourself. So if you're interested in the Jupyter Notebooks demo, you can go ahead and look at this link. But if you're interested in trying out RESTbook and GitHub issues, download Insiders and check out these two links to go test those extensions out. And lastly, if you're interested in trying to build your own custom notebook, we're finalizing the API very soon. But in the meantime, you can go ahead and watch this deep dive, which tells you all about what it takes to build a custom notebook extension. Um, and it's a very uh, informative view of what you can reuse and what you might have to create yourself. So now that we've talked about extending the editor through notebooks, I wanna bring it back for the rest of the demo that we have into talking about the core of VS Code, our bread and butter, which is our editing and debugging features. So first I wanna talk about testing. To do that, I'm gonna go into a new repo, the VS Code repo, and show you some of the new testing features that we have. Uh, one of the most popular extensions and feature requests uh, was about creating a test runner experience natively into core. Uh, we wanted to provide an integrated experience uh, so that, for instance, if you are working on an app with a JavaScript front end and maybe a Python back end, you don't need to install two different test runners or two different uh, sets of UI and different decorators to understand information about your tests failing and passing. So we created an, a built-in uh, test runner experience. It's not yet finalized, so I'm actually self-hosting a test provider extension for the sake of the demo, but it's give you a good sneak peek of what to expect. So I've got this test explorer and it shows me all the different way, all the different tests I have in my code. Um, and it really allows me to filter through them and kind of navigate where they are in my code base. So for instance, I can right click and go to test. Um, and I can see the different tests that I have. I can filter through them. So let's go ahead and search for our arrays test. And I can see the entire test suite as well as specific tests. So for instance, I can run a specific one um, let's go ahead and run a single one and immediately get back whether or not it's passing or succeeding in a nice visual way. Um, we wanted to provide a way to organize test suites and test results. Um, and I can also run them from the gutter action that you see over here. So you can right click and run the entire suite. Traditionally, you might be running tests within a CLI and having to go through console output when tests fail. So for instance, in this example, one of my test cases failed. And instead of having to search through lots of raw plain text to see what failed, I get a really rich uh, diff editor experience to see what my expected output was and what it actually was, right? Tr uh, traditionally, I might open up the console and see the result of my tests. But for a situation like this, a lot of the output is truncated. So I have to do a lot more mental visualization to see what went wrong. So with the diff editor and the test explorer, you can kind of easily uh, debug failing tests and spend less time going through a lot of the output. So if I wanted to, the next thing I might do is put a breakpoint here, rerun the test in debug mode. So there's lots of actions that you can do with the Test Explorer UI. Um, things that we're still working on is being able to show you a more uh, historic uh, a view of your previous runs. Uh, you can imagine integrating current extensions with this Test Explorer UI, as well as being able to maybe imagine a, a scenario where you might um, integrate this with CI. So when the next time you make a PR to a repo, you can see which of the tests failed and which of them passed. So that's a really cool way to kind of interact with the test explorer. One more thing I wanna show is being able to use filtering in here. So we can only see the failed tests or we can only see the executed tests. Um, so that's one way that we wanna give you back more time as a developer. The last thing I wanna show is more debugging features. So let me close this out. All right. 
So we've added in a new debugger for JavaScript. You might ask, why are we doing that? Uh, we wanted to consolidate the client-side debugging and the server-side debugging experience and give you back more information about your apps while you're debugging to make it more useful for you. Similarly to testing, we wanted one consistent experience and we wanted to also give you more visual um, UI that you could work with. So first thing I'm gonna do is open up a JavaScript debug terminal. I can do that multiple ways. So here I can open up from the debug view, the JavaScript debug terminal. I can go over to my package.json and use the handy dandy uh, code lens and start my script from here. Or I can just open up a terminal and create a new JavaScript debug terminal. Cool, so let me go into our Express server. The JavaScript debug terminal is kind of like a magic terminal. Everything that you enter in here will be debugged. So let's go ahead and start our server. And you can see that it started up the server and also attached the debugger to it. So there's a couple of things I wanna show you about what the JavaScript debugger can help you with. Two things, profiling and performance. So you can start profiling the individual node processes that are running. So here I can start a performance profile and I'll stop it manually. And let me just go over and hit this endpoint a couple of times. All right, and now I'm gonna stop my profile. And I get this really awesome view of the amount of time um, that each of my functions within my program took, right? So I can see things like the individual time per function, which is over here, as well as the amount of time that, like the total time that that function took because it calls other functions. So I can see that under total time over here. So this is a really nice way to get a really good snapshot of the frequency of calls, the complexity, the duration, um, and help you with uh, profiling. If, you're, if you don't prefer a view like this, you can also wait for it, get a really nice view uh, with this flame graph. So I really like looking at this because it helps me get a better understanding of all the individual calls made. If you're working on a server that gets thousands and thousands of calls, instead of doing individual calls, you can use this, which will aggregate and dedupe across your call stack. And so now you can see the total duration of some of these calls. Um, so for instance, I can see that there is intentionally a slow spell check method that's being called somewhere in my code. I can go in and easily navigate to it by pressing control click. And this brings back some of that profiling information directly into my code. So we see the code lens of how much time it's taking and it also pinpoints where exactly that function is. Obviously to optimize this, I would not do this and I would probably use a better data structure. Um, so I got this information though, because I was able to take a profile and collect and view that information. If, if you're not into profiling or if that's not something you like to go deeply into, you can still reap the benefits of using the JavaScript debugger with this real-time performance chart. So if I hit my endpoint a little bit, a couple more times, you can see while I'm working on it in debug mode, that I can start seeing when there is a memory spike or when there's a CPU spike. Um, so this is a great way to not maybe necessarily take a profile, but still get that real-time information um, ambiently while you're still working to see if maybe a change you did caused a spike somewhere. All right, so we just showed you some of the latest and greatest of what we've been working on for testing, debugging, custom notebooks, and Jupyter notebooks. Try them out, let us know what's working and what's not working for you, what else you'd like to see from us, and we'd love to hear your feedback on different social channels as well as on GitHub. Thank you for attending. Hopefully we'll be back soon with even more VS Code features to show off. Thanks for watching everyone.